And um, hello Instagram, hello YouTube, thank you everyone for again stopping by this Wednesday evening. Sasha is here in another episode, everything you wanted to know about dogs but you didn't have whom to ask. Today we are live streaming this event from Orlando, Florida, where we are actually going um, uh, on our conference that we have actually taken a very active participation in and a little more about all of that um, i'm gonna unreveal through my stories and later on on youtube um, i'm recording some vlogs from here as well so you're going to be able to um, travel with us as well so uh, thank you so much again for very nice interest in this amazing and wonderful uh, episode and we got again like a lot of um, emails and questions that I'm gonna take and uh, without further ado, do just start answering. But also you're very welcome to ask uh, any questions live. I'll be very be, I'll be very happy to take anything that you would consider interesting for you to discuss with me uh, tonight. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we just this week was very interesting for us and very um, emotional for us because after like almost uh, I must say now five years in development, we launched our uh, Pure Love and Harmony Institute, and uh, Pure Love and Harmony Institute actually will uh, is a br uh, will require it's a self-funded institution that uh, that will you know open up uh, researches uh, that will serve development of the new paradigm when the human dog interaction is in place and the first big study that we will undergo will be study of how we how with our behavior we impact uh, dogs physiology so there is some significant um, uh, idea in this that uh, you you behave and you are what you are and so we in order if we want to become something else and behave in a different way and uh, have some other results in our life, every single uh, psychologist and this neuroscience um, and whichever direction you want to go, it's very interesting that everyone calls us if you want to, uh, first you need to become and then you will have it. And then if we put that in a place in the, in the realm of dogs, it's very interesting so, to see. And this first study that we have is a, like a approach to physiological impact by behavior so how are because the dogs behave according to environment that we place them in in our interaction with them because the dog's behavior is a response on our way of communicating with dogs so if the dogs responds to us based on what we provide to the dogs so aim of this study is to see how our behavior towards dogs directly impacts their physiology because changes their uh, hormonal status that if uh, remains for a longer time it can really impact their brain and through their brain the entire physiology so what we want to do is bring in these groundbreaking uh, research methodology methodologies like in very specific and customized uh, uh, analysis of the here, so you, we're going to provide, we're going to ask every one of you who participate in our study to provide a sample of your dog's hair. And then we're going to analyze that uh, sample in our lab. Uh, and then we're going to learn about uh, mineral structure of the coat. So we will have an, a history of your dog's life uh, because everything that was uh, happening in the dog's body will be reflecting the mineral uh, component of the hair if properly if properly analyzed that hair sh that hair piece can provide a lot of significant uh, significant um, uh, informations about the dog's life how we can learn about that is through the mineral 
um, what's happening in, in the code in regard of mineral uh, ratios and mineral uh, structure of the code. Then we're going to conduct the study of three, three, three months, and then we're going to incorporate a healing behavior modification of the dogs that are anxious, for example, that are participating in the study. And then we will track the outcome after five. So total, the study going to uh, last for five months. And in that time, we're going to see the possible change that the uh, implementation of the PLH, like uh, pure love and harmony communication, like a harmony method of communication con to the dog, can have on their physiology. So I, imp uh, so I, um, I kind of invite every one of you to sign up uh, to participate in this study because the study is complementary for you. It's kind of, uh, it's cost you nothing, but it can bring a lot of uh, very important informations how human dog interaction is impacted by our perception of the dog's world and then how the dog world actually reacts on our environment that we create around them and then how that completely changes their physiology and how actually the outcome of the study will be that we will be finally able to face that our perception of the dog's world is or is not correct. And then if we change the environment in which dogs live, the hypothesis is that actually the uh, structure, mineral structure of the dog's uh, fur will be seen, so we will be able to track that. How is that, uh, on which foundation that hypothesis is uh, set? So, and that's actually very important for us to understand uh, how, the, how the wolf life develops, so how the wolf develops themselves into a dog's. And the very important groundbreaking uh, knowledge for that provided uh, l like a beginning of the, like in 60s of uh, 20th century, uh, the Russian etiologist and biologist named Dr. Dmitry Belyaev conducted silver fox experiment that is still ongoing in Siberia. But uh, there was very interesting beginning of that study where the, the local, local uh, farmers that, that were kind of like breeding the silver foxes for the fur uh, asked him to uh, give them a significant possibilities to raise the foxes that won't be as much as aggressive as the ones that were kept in cages and were bred just because of the fur. So what he was coming to the idea, like a breeder or like a theologist, he said, if I will start breeding for tameness, possibly that the generation that will come will be more tame, and as they become more tame, it will be much easier to be handled. So what happened is that, yes, in just a couple of genera generations, just breeding for tameness, he was able to uh, come up and uh, breed completely very calm uh, breed of the f silver foxes that were very, very friendly towards humans. But what happened in our, as an, a side effect of that, very, very interesting, it was not a side effect, is what outcome of that, of that experiment was that those foxes started to look different. They didn't uh, the, for at at once like their their ear their ears become fluff, floppy, and their 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 they become like uh, brachycephal. The under uh, the jaw were like uh, going little forward. Their eyes started to round, and then the tail started to curve. They even started to get uh, white patches. Some of them were be born like uh, white foxes completely. And there, on, on top of everything, they started to develop a communication with the, that, that the foxes were not having like normally, and they started to bark. So he said, like, this is un, unnormal and unpredictable way of the evolution because that's why the silver foxes have their name. They are called silver foxes because it's silver fox. And if you look in a generation in behind, nowhere you can find the foxes with this physiology that suddenly started to be uh, uh, shown in this, as an outcome of this breeding only to a tameness. So then he said, like, okay, let's just do the, the blood work and the hormone analysis, analysis and see what's the, why, why this phenomena is happening. So when he was doing the uh, hormonal analysis of the blood of those foxes, 
there was very, very interesting and significant discovery that shaped the reality of our dogs that we have today and much easier to understand how this evolution uh, of the dogs actually happened. So <clears throat> what we find out actually that the dogs, that the foxes that are very tame and very close, they, they have a ten intention to uh, develop a different, completely different relationship with the humans, had a much less adrenaline and a cortisol in their, in their system. On the other side, the foxes that were very uh, afraid of humans and even attacking them had a high level of adrenaline and the cortisol within their system. And then he said, this survival mode of the constant stress and the foxes being constantly under pressure of the environment they were living in were putting them in a fight, flight, or freeze mode, freeze, uh, like a fly freeze or fight mode. On the other side, the foxes that were bred towards tameness, they become much more appealing to a humans. Why? And he said, like, it's easy to explain because the moment the adrenaline level drops off, the moment the survival in the nature starts becoming less and less important for survival, some other traits are much more important for survival, and then all kind of other hormones that were blocked by the cortisol and adrenaline start to show up. And that is why the, uh, the all, all of that melanin colors and the, all of those traits that were not significant for the, for the, for the species as the silver fox are, at once started to show up as a new survival mode because the foxes that will look much appealing, r r less frightening to humans would be probably much easier to um, come close to. And that is where this human-dog interaction as well calls for very careful analysis, like how much stressful environment we let our dogs live in because our perception of the world they need to live in is coming from the humanization of the dogs, comes from, comes from our shoes. The perception we, we, we transfer of the world, we transfer to our dogs, it's completely human perception of the world that nothing has to do with the canine perception of the world. And then if we try to make a dogs be humans, they experience a high level of stress. And if I'm right, indeed, what I'm hypothesizing around, then what's going to happen is that we're gonna, we are going and we are making a Benyaev experiment go in reverse. Instead of lowering the level of hormones, a lowering the level of stress and survival mode in dogs and constant stress and chronic stress that leads to all kinds of anxiety and behavioral issues, that are expression of the hormonal change due to this constant stress and why they are con un under constant stress. For example, try listening to this, what I'm talking. Sada ću početi da pričam na srpskom jeziku koje možda većina od vas uopšte ne razume. I koliko god se ja trudio da budem dobar i da objasnim najbolje što mogu, vi to nećete razumeti. No matter what I told you on my native Serbian language in the previous sentence, Without understanding and knowing Serbian, you wouldn't be able to know what I told you. Exactly. And if you would be living with me, and if you would be loving me as the dogs and humans interact on that level, and we constantly talk different languages, the frustration would just raise and go higher and higher and higher and higher, because no matter how hard you try, without knowing the language I'm talking on, you won't be able to understand me. And that's where the human dog problem comes in. They cannot learn human language, but we can do, we can do, we, we do have a tools and we do have a knowledge to learn a canine language. So the pure love and harmony, harmonic bonding is actually learning the canine language. And if we will be able to provide the owners of the dogs that will be participating in this study with enough knowledge to understand and learn canine communication language and then to implement in everyday life and with their dogs, um, we assume that the stress level will be dropping down. As the stress level is dropping down, other hormones going to raise up. And in raising 
that uh, level. So the interaction now of the thyroid glands and the adrenaline glands and the uh, uh, interaction of those glands with the brains and the perception of the world in this triangle that we talked about last time, like uh, amygdala, uh, prefrontal cortex and hypothalamus will be completely in service of the uh, well-being of the dogs. And the outcome of that might be very, very, very interesting to see. So I invite every one of you to join this study. Just simply, uh, simply click either link below if you are watching us on YouTube or click link in uh, bio of this uh, Facebook page, uh, Instagram page, so you will be able to navigate to the explanation of the study, deeper, learn more about the uh, Pure Event Harmony Institute, and on the end, subscribe to this wonderful uh, journey and enjoy the study. And in these five months that we're gonna go through the study, learn all about what actually is happening in your dog's body as an outcome of our interaction. Okay, so uh, without now, I like took a little longer time to explain uh, about the study and how I'm gonna take any questions that you might have. Some of them you submitted already through, through the, through the, is there any questions on YouTube? No, so far. So wherever you are watching us from, you are welcome to ask. You have a YouTube channel and you can ask me as well on on um, on um, this uh, mm, what's the name of this Instagram. Okay, so we have <clears throat> uh, constantly question I get from a lot of you. It's uh, kind of which kind of food I suggest to for your pups. So I have all kind of brands, dry fru dry food, and all kind of dry you know brands that I kind of which kind of high-end brand you recommend so my global uh, my global understanding on this is as follows so uh, averagely food dog food industry is maybe maximum like 100 years old and the question becomes like what our dogs have eaten before that we live with the dogs 14,000 years and the dog food dry dog food industry is like 100 years old maybe max and also what's very important to understand is how which kind of life for example my grandmother lived next to her dogs and which kind of life we live today with our dogs when i was going to the veterinarian school and uh, when i was undergoing veterinarian study you couldn't learn about the dog specially because the dogs were not having any trouble and any issues uh, known to a mankind to be treated and specially designed uh, courses for the dog or small animal practice. The small animal practice becomes much interesting and specializing through the veterinary universities in the later years, like maybe 20, 30 years uh, in the past. But before that, the dog was considered like another animal that doesn't have uh, too much problems. So the veterinarian study was not even considering treating the dogs as something that should be uh, like a generally uh, be concerned about. And what happens there is the more dry food industry went into the competition over the you know, market share, the more veterinarian problems started to arise among the dogs. So today we have this terrible um, idea of uh, dog food that is amazing for the, for the humans, Uh, how villagers and the shepherds bred are and raise their rural dogs. Okay, there you go. That's very, thank you, Odmetniki Otsutan, for your very kind and weekly interaction with me. And uh, you're like shaping my lives. And then I'm very, very like thankful for that. Um, so <clears throat> um, um, just let me finish this question that was uh, before answer uh, uh, asked uh, from my messages it's which food which dry food i do recommend so i do not recommend any dry food and uh, why it's because the dry food is uh, you know comp uh, i call it like um, how you call it? how would you say that hay for rabbits. yeah hay for rabbits with the taste and smell and that's all because you just need to follow the money if you can buy the premium pet food, let's say for $2 a pound, 
and uh, food uh, like a pound of the meat cost ten dollars in the retail so can you imagine if the retail price for the dry pet food is two dollar per pound the most expensive one around two dollar per pound how much the the shares and the uh, profits of the retail the distributor the cost of the transportation the operational cost of the of the manufacturer the, the all of those the the, the 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 advertisement and everything and even if it's two dollar a pound of the dog food it still remains the most uh, a profitable industry to invest so if the food you pay for the food two pounds, two dollar per pound. That means that in that food is nothing. There is nothing. It's a concentrate. It's a concentrate of all kind of lab made, um, I don't know, uh, fillers and uh, vitamins and whatever is there. So what I suggest is you cook for your food. And on my Instagram and TikTok and everywhere, where you, wherever you go, me talking about the food, you have uh, recommendations of the one one two formula. So 112 formula means 25% of the, of the veggies, 25% of the fruits, and 50% of the organ meat, total of uh, four parts. And that will create whatever, which kind of food you want to make for your dog. And that again, engaging with the dogs, it's very important uh, in your lifestyle because the dogs love to eat leftovers of the human food. So if that's like that, so let's give them what's left of our dinner table. Make them make make it we make make them that food with love, and they're gonna love it and enjoy it long run. So cook for your dogs. Don't don't um, um, don't delegate that to someone else. Just be present for your dogs. Do it once in a week, once in ten days, once in five days. It's gonna take like maybe an hour, maybe less of your time just to make it until you do not learn how to do that much, much uh, faster. Uh, you're going to improve that. It can be a family environmental um, kind of like a um, happy time of the day or the night or whatever. But the dog's going to love it and it's going to be much more uh, interesting for them to interact with you if you will really dedicate your time, your love to their health. So... We have a question from the Instagram. It says, like, how villagers and shepherds bred and raise their rural dogs? Uh, it's uh, kind of like a time, time that we, you know, need to discuss that as well. Because I was, uh, I was serving and I was, uh, you know, under supervision. I had a couple of mentors. One was with uh, uh, German short hair pointers and the other one was with Siberian huskies. And both of them had a very, very highly... Um, uh, if highly bred dogs to performance. So the German short hair pointers and uh, huskies. The ones were sled dogs, the other ones was hunters. And uh, what's very important to understand is that these dogs, both of the, and I'm, I'm sorry, also there was a breeder from Italy. So one uh, German hair dog, short hair pointers are from Serbia. Huskies are from France and Napolitan Mastiffs are from Italy. So those three breeders I was uh, spending a lot of time with. I spent my you know, childhood in those kennels, working for them and learning from those people. And what I learned there will uh, shape my perception of the, how the real, real breeding uh, for the performance should be done. So uh, first, all of those dogs were kept in use of what they are bred for so the huskies were huskies were uh, sled dogs the german shep the german pointers were were the uh, were the uh, like a hunting dogs so they they would take them in hunt and that what was very important the ones that were hunting the great the hunting so so the hunters uh, the ones that were performing great the this guy uh, Ilya Latinovich was his name. He's a doctor. He's a scientist in the canine. Very, very old. I think he's not anymore with us. But I owe him a lot of my perception about the health of the dogs and how the dogs are healthy, uh, healthy bred. So what he did, he, he, he had them like uh, maybe around 40 or 50 in the kennel, in the one kennel. It was like a, uh, like maybe... 100 meters with 100 meters so it was an enormously big enclosure 
uh, those dogs would were live freely there and they would breed freely so you would have a bunch of the bitches there and you would have a bunch of males there every single time when the male when the beach was in heat she was surrounded with the males that were fighting for that beach so the beach was always choosing the males she would be bred to on her own without a human influence it would be the same with that guy with the with the with the Serbian guy with German sh uh, short hair pointers, it would be the same in in France with a with a lady. They were like critiqued the most. Oh, you don't do that. You don't do this. You kind of you can't do that. But actually, those dogs were performing perfectly. They were bred to perfection. They were like also very successful show dogs, very high end performance dogs. And uh, very, 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 very healthy dogs. Because, and that's answer to your question, how the rural dogs are bred. They're always bred by performance. So the puppies are expected to be even better performance, to perform better. And the uh, uh, shepherds and the hunters and all of those people would choose to remain only with the dogs that can serve uh, their purpose. So the dogs that were not good for the breeding because they didn't perform properly, they would be completely on a side from the, from the how you say that, uh, from completely from a side of possibilities to breed. So they kept them separately. But the dogs that were performing properly and that were like looking properly, they would always because that's uh, that's the question, like how uh, how the, he gave to those dogs a pedigree if he didn't know the real uh, father of the litter. You always know real the father of the litter because it's interestingly all the bitches almost get in the heat and a season almost at the same time. And you would have almost always the most dominant male to be the father. And uh, what he was uh, eyewitnessing, the pedigree was just given to the dogs that he could eyewitness uh, the father and the mother, but the other ones wouldn't have a pedigree. But for the quality of the dog's life, the pedigree is completely irrelevant and unimportant. Because now we think that if pedigree is known, then you will know if you track the pedigree that you will be able to predict some uh, genetic uh, possibilities uh, and some genetic trade that can be uh, put uh, up front. But the uh, problem of uh, this way of uh, breeding is actually uh, life of the dogs that we have today, where most of the breed bred dogs are collapsing uh, all over the place with their health issues, but with their uh, like a very small genetic stock around. And that's where <clears throat> the, the, the real life... Uh, you know, repeats itself and the question becomes like, how do we, how do we pursue with these dogs forward? You have uh, a lot of uh, like, a, if we can call them bastard dogs, like these doodles and moodles and poodles and all kinds of dogs that are bred and crossbred and things like that among the breeds. And uh, yet you don't have, those dogs don't have a pedigree. And a lot of them, if they are bred, not because of the look, but because of the character, that they would be much healthier than the dogs bred for the look. Because uh, inter interestingly, what you asked is actually that if you breed for the performance, you will always get a uh, beautiful, beautiful look as an outcome of that, as a secondary effect of that. Because that is how the people were breeding the dogs uh, in, uh, when the breeds were uh, discovered. It was not say, oh my God, this one is husky, breed it with this husky. There were no huskies like 500 years ago or 100 or 200 years, years ago. They were just a dog that was sledding good. And then the other one sledding also good. And if you breed them, the puppies would probably sled better. So the, on, the other, on the other side, if you have, for example, hunters, you had in Africa, like in the Middle East, you have those all of those... Um, all of those, uh, 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 how you call them, uh, how you call her to you? Sighthounds, for example, Salukis, right? No one said that the Saluki should look like this and have an open nose and having a high tuck up and deep chest so he can run faster. No, 
the 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 the, the people were very very uh, interesting in performance. They said, "Oh, this one this one catches fast, very very fast. Uh, it's faster. And if we breed this fast dog to another fast dog, it's probably that the offspring is going to be much faster." And that is what happened. And as they become faster, due to only trait selection their shape of the body become different. They, they went half, uh, like faster and faster and faster and faster. So that's where, the, that's where you uh, come to this perception of if we would be able today to bring this trait back, to breathe according to the performance success, then we wouldn't have all of these problems because you cannot perform if the body is weak. But if we... Uh, breed this dog to that be just because they are champions and the champion comes from my perception of the judge and three people like me say, oh this is beautiful dog give him a champion title and then you breed two champions and the offspring become completely uh, like uh, unuseful uh, living a lot of pain with a lot of genetic disease and things like that so if we would be able to bring back a performance but the dogs are not used anymore so it's a, when we speak about the huskies let's look uh, the looks of the working husky is um, uh, Alaskan husky, not standard mud, uh, uh, not standard mud dogs bred for work. Uh, it's again like everything that's uh, everything that is bred per performance provides the beautiful body as an outcome to that because the beautiful body of the dog is only beautiful if can provide uh, uh, the provide the purpose of that breed so every breed looks specific way in specific way because those breeds are meant to do something so the beauty of the breed is outcome of the beautiful performance of that breed not because they are beautiful to the eye when they move or when they groom them or when we put them in stand that's not what the beauty of the dog is the beautiful the dog is more the dog is able to perform more performance, the dog is more performant, the, the, the beauty of the dog comes from that perception. So that's why we have a beautiful husky or the beautiful Rottweilers or the beautiful poodles or the beautiful uh, terriers of any kind. Because those dogs are bred to do something. And by breeding them to do that specific trade, the outcome of that breeding become the look of the dogs they had. Because with that particular look, the dogs were able to perform much easier. And then as we bred them to these performance and trades that they are bred to do, they become much more different than the other dogs bred not to do that particular trade, but something else. So it's not the same in a, in a, in a, it's not the same what you're going to use a Rottweiler for, right? It become a, it, it become a, it become a very, uh, like a military driven breed but it was a shepherd you know for the for the you know and then the boxers also like they 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 uh, they they like they were like um how you call that they were like a cattle cattle shepherds uh, on the beginning and then that what they were bred for that this under Joe that they have the brand that 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 face was giving them a chance to bite the bite the by the hawk of the of the of the cows without hurting them so that's where the this this face of the but but then and that now as we turn them and use them for something else then the trade of using them and purpose of using them loses its essence because maybe the german shepherd or the doberman or the uh, i don't know malinoa can perform much easier tasks that are expected from the rottweiler nowadays and now more you breed Rottweilers to perform in that environment where the type of the Malinois and Doberman and German Shepherd look of the body is needed, we're going to get more lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter dogs. And then we would come, oh, this is beautiful dog. It almost looks like a tiny little dog. I don't speak about a particular uh, breeds here and like a, uh, specimens here and there. I speak about the breed in general become much lighter than it was when it was used to uh, for what it was purposefully made so 
And the beauty of the dog today, slowly, as we take this dog in the environment that's not actually the purposeful environment at the beginning of their selection, when the people started to bred them, we're going to slowly change the look of the dog. It's not because we, we kind of like we want to do that, but it's outcome of the selection towards the different trait. So that's where I think, again, uh, <clears throat> I'm completely up. If I would start breeding dogs today, I would start doing the same way. I would breed because breeding dogs, it's very like a <clears throat> it's an art. And every single art, you need to have an, a choice of the colors and choice of the genetic uh, material and choice of the of the possibilities. But then you need to also allow to those dogs to express themselves in the com in the environment that will give them a chance to choose themselves for the best uh, possible uh, offspring. And every single female can choose better for herself than any human can help her. Because oftentimes we have a, we have a bitches that, and uh, females that doesn't want to breed with this particular dog. Why? Because she knows that that's not a good combination for her. How does she know? Because every single hormone has its smell. So the, the dog, when she's in heat, she can pick the perfect dog for herself. And then what happens? The, dog, the bitch doesn't want to breed with this dog, but we say, oh, this is a champion. It would be best for our puppies. I'll, I would be able very easy to sell these puppies. So what they do, they, they take these dogs to a veterinarian and they, they, they bred them together, even though none of them wanted to breed each other. And then the puppies comes, and then oftentimes what we have seen is the mother is rejecting the puppies because she doesn't want to raise them. Why she doesn't want to raise them? Because the puppies are genetically completely out from the health, and then she just doesn't want to give the energy to those puppies. And what we do, we go there and save the puppies because we feel sorry for the puppies. And then the puppies grow, and then which kind of message we send to, those, to that particular uh, litter? is less capable of you for survival, much more human attention you will get. The outcome of that is completely ruined line of the dog's breed. I don't say that we should, we should um, leave those puppies to die, but we should be conscious about which kind of genetic material those puppies carry and be responsible not to put them in further uh, breeding program. Even if we're going to raise them, we should raise them because they're already born. But why did they, why did they got born? Because we, may, we artificially made combination of the, uh, of, of the parents that wouldn't do it in, in the nature. They, that she, wouldn't, she was aggressive towards, towards dog. Why? Because she didn't want to breed with that dog. And what we did, we took the dog, we took, that, the, we took, that, uh, we took them to a veterinarian and we had them artificially inseminated, she was forced to do that. If I would breed dogs today, I would have a variety of the, not maybe variety of the, of the females, I would always have a variety of the males that I will offer to a female. And the real responsible breeders would let female choose from the males. And she will always choose the one that's right for her and for her offspring. And we don't know what those smells and how the bitches are choosing their, their, uh, their partner, but there is a significant natural way of dogs breathing and why they get to mate and why they are giving the offspring because the, the bitch, the, the female dog, will always attract and let her be bred by the dog or made by the dog that will give the most benefit to her puppies. And in order to do that, she needs to have a choice. But then we will say, oh my God, but if you put two dogs next to a female in season, they would fight. Yeah, they would fight. But just for a while, until they do not find which one, which one is stronger. And then the one that's not strong, she just backs up. The dogs fight very slowly. If the humans doesn't go into a fight with the dogs, and if we do not bring like too much anxiety into, into a dog fight, the dog would end up the fight very fast and easy. 
because the dog doesn't fight. The dog fight just as an outcome of the of the of the of the an anxious attack that they are into by protecting their humans. If you if you would ever observe the dogs fight in the na in the rural as I did, I like I was you, studying the rural dogs behavior in uh, in the garbages of, of of Mexico and Cuba and Bulgaria and Albania and uh, Serbia. I was going observing those dogs. You never have the fights, no matter how big, how big a, a pack of those dogs were. They would go into the fight, but the fight that would call that that would last like maybe a second or two. The moment they establish which one is a is a, is a, is a stronger, then the other one goes submissive, and that's it. They wouldn't go to fight each other until the death. They are fighting for the humans to the death. They would kill another dog just to protect their humans. So again, the dogs that are aggressive and that would go into the deep, you know, deep interaction with the other dogs to kill the other, they will kill the other dogs to please their humans or to protect them. You mean free rural dogs and stray dogs get rich choice for breeding rather than plant breeding? I, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah, that's the observation. That's the observation of every single anthropologies and the etiology and the biologies that was, you know, I, I can say that I'm all of that, but I was part of those missions and expeditions, and I was mentored by the people that were uh, that were uh, observing the dogs in the wild. And when you said the dogs in the wild, it means that you observe the stray dogs that are living on the garbage, on the garbage, uh, how you call that, uh, line fields. Um, landfills aside of the cities and you have a thousands and millions of those dogs because how the Ray Coppinger said like it was like uh, 2012 I think when he did deliver this speech it was like very interesting speech where he said like there is that that was then uh, significantly changed the number but the uh, interaction in between the, the percentages didn't change then he said like there is approximately one billion dogs on the planet a total, and the humans have only selective breeding or influence over 15 percent, so 150 million dogs at that time. If we do have that, there is now like um, uh, close to 700 um, um, total, like we stray dogs and other dogs that are living outside. Of, so he said that always 75% of the dogs live happy, stray life around the human existence and the humans doesn't see them. But these dogs still need humans because they live on our leftovers. They live on our garbage farms, on our landfills and everywhere. And the cities like uh, New York, Belgrade, Skopje maybe, I don't know, here and there, they might not have them in a, in a center because they would be um, not getting into those places, but they still exist. And uh, that's what uh, everyone, that, that's a scientific consensus. And if we want to really understand how, who, what is a dog, then we need to go and learn about the dogs that we don't learn no mu much about. Dog is not a poodle. Dog is not, that's a breed of the dog. And the dog species, as a species, the dog lives happy rural life on the landfills of the garbages around the human cities, big cities. But then I, when I say cities, maybe you don't have them as much next to New York as you might have them as much as next to Shanghai or Beijing or, or Moscow or Serbia somewhere or anywhere else. It says, when I was a little kid, I have been following stray dogs and watch them how they breed and interact. There you go. So that's, that's what we need to try to find a way. Every single breeder that's responsible today, it will have, but then you, you have another very important thing when you breed those dogs like that for the for the for the puppies uh, for the that will become pets so the puppies that we're gonna from that kind of environment come and live next to next to us in our beds and things like that is always very important to give them the right way of socialization when they when they grow as a puppies 
to have a mother at the right time, to be introduced to another litter, to another dogs, to right interaction with the first humans, and then to be put in another family on time. So the development of the dog's uh, consciousness and mind and uh, stability within the physiological well-being of them would be intact and would be perfect because the breeding program is the very important foundation but then on that foundation the humans build and then everything starts with the breeder and then ends up you know slowly with the old, old owner and the most important ones in this lineup are the breeders that need to raise the healthy puppies and then to raise them not only like breed them and then raise them and then you know just not do nothing with them because a the human soci socialization for those puppies is very important because those dogs are not going to trade or do whatever they are bred to do they're going to become pets and the pets need to be socialized towards humans right away because you have the the <clears throat> in those first couple of weeks of dog's life in between especially in between um, zero so the day they are born until 10 weeks you get all the adolescence life of the humans so until the 10 weeks everything is settled it's prefrontal cortex of the dog is already uh, like uh, already you can uh, the, the dogs develop themselves completely that's why it's so important for the new owners if they can really follow the lead the best way to take a puppy away from the mother and from the litter would be in between eight nine uh, ten would be already almost late because the, that door which the dogs naturally have in the in the nature because of what what how, how this little uh, lineup looks like so they are born and they are completely dependent on the mother so until they do not open their eyes they don't know nothing else rather than just just you know sitting sleeping and drinking milk of mom so when they open their eyes like with a 10 10 11 9 days in that environment they already start looking oh there is someone else i have some brother so they start to interact among themselves and there is the first one where the mom pulls back and let the puppies learn which which puppy goes where so you will see at at the at the at the you know, a couple of, in, in that second, third, fourth week, you will see the mom stepping aside and let puppies play in between themselves. And then once that establishes that time, there is a time when they go out, but come back, but then go out from the, it, it would be like, um, you know, uh, if we observe any canine uh, pack of the, of the animals um, uh, that live in a group, you will see that uh, six, seven, weeks they would slowly start and get out to interact with the other part of the pack and that's the time when they are ready to embrace the new world and that's the time when you take a puppy and you put the puppy in the new family because that's the easiest way for the puppy it's a natural pro it's a natural evolution of the puppy to introduce and get accepted by the other other family so if that's not done properly and I can understand that there is a lot of dogs that are taken from shelter. There are a lot of dogs that are saved from the street and all kinds of those things. And then we have, again, but what's important then is to perform the same way. So even if you adopt the dog and you bring the dog at home with two years, five years, whatever, you will undergo and you will treat the dog in the first couple of days as you got the puppy. So that dog completely goes through the same way as you will treat your little puppy of six weeks because that's where you give the dog chance to stay, step aside, to observe you, to see who you are, to set to respect your boundaries, to get closer to you as much as possible, to move up, to understand where they stay. And then when they adopt you as a, as a new family member, then you are completely theirs. But that doesn't matter. So the, what's very important is when we bring the puppies or the dogs in our home, to let them there that one day, two days, where they where you will give them the space for them to recover from wherever do they come from. And then if you give them that space and you just be there for them and you just provide them, but also provide them with the space, that becomes healing for them. And then they accept you because they go they will go again through that same uh, way of introduction to the new environment that they are put in as a puppies and you will be able to mimic that movement uh, again 
once you adapt them. So the, the interaction, the human dog interaction uh, is the best if it can happen with the new owners in the ages of the, like in between six, seven, eight would be. So six, end of six, seven, eight, nine, that's the max and the beginning of the 10, that window closes forever. But then if that's done properly, then the dog slowly develops that so-called like um, a very secure attachment towards humans and then doesn't matter who the human is. But if you have them uh, later on interact with humans, again, you can develop a secure attachment with, uh, with you as a new human if you provide what other humans didn't provide. And that's a secure attachment possibilities and the dog feels safe in your environment because you provide protect and lead. And that's where the secure attachment comes from and then the dogs can finally relax. Bronos says, but there's so many bad breeders. Yeah, there are so many bad breeders, but then what you need to do, thank you, Donna, again. I wish you warm welcoming again and thank you for your question. Uh, that's where we need to start um, uh, kind of like um, uh, we need to start uh, advocating for this wherever you can to use every single sense you can uh, to advocate for the good uh, breathing. Uh, that whatever we can do, we need to do that. And of course, again, there would be so many wrongdoings, but what we need to do is do our job properly. We can, uh, you know, inspire people to buy from good places, inspire people one day buy the puppy, help them as much as we can in order to have those dogs develop a secure attachment through the rituals and everything that we can do. We can change the world, if, but we can change our perception and we can do whatever is in our possibility and responsibility to keep doing so more people join this movement of the mindset towards dogs and then finally it's occasionally going to change the world but we we start small steps in our neighborhood by this kind of podcast and then you do yours and someone else does his and or hers and then more people start doing their job because sometime there is a calling that we need to perform and i could resist this talk as much as i want but there was so much need of me coming out and finally put all of this in front of the camera and do my part because there is maybe someone that that's that whose actions gonna depend on my doings so if every one of us would be responsible for what what's to fulfill their part of the duty this world would look completely different and thank you for staying so faithful with us and you know continuing your your support trust and uh, you know interest in this what we do and that's also the way to impact uh, you 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 impact one person around you and then that person someone else is and well and that slowly grows so you know if you you know how my teacher said they can they can take me or they can they can prevent me from speaking on every platform but then i'm gonna speak in in the in the in the in the bus i'm gonna speak in the in the in a, in a, in a, on a marketplace, I'm gonna speak in parks, but I'm gonna spread the message as much as I can because that's what we need to do in order to, you know, to save these dogs from being, uh, being you know abused by environment and by not knowing things. Uh, is cheap meat for dogs better option for than dry food? There is a people selling dog meat one kilo per euro. You just need to know what's what's inside that meat and what the meat consists of. So the good uh, meat for the dogs, the best dog meat is organ meat, uh, liver, kidneys, heart, brain, testicles, in, intestines, and all kind of those things are much better and much. And then you get veggies and you get fruits and all those two combined in this formula, 112 always gets the best result for the dogs. It is, no matter the cheapest food that you can cook for your dog, that, that, uh, that dog for probably is a lot of bones and uh, all kind of mashed up, uh, whatever. But kind of like if you would buy that one and then add a little more of organ meat to, uh, to that would be perfect, much better than the most expensive dry food on the market. Donna, I hope I answered your, your question. Like maybe we can't kind of like protect ourselves from the bad breeding, but we can 
uh, we can you know do our part and make more responsible owners that gonna go after the responsible breeding and buy from pup buy puppies from the right places and that would probably make these bre breeders that are irresponsible just better because the course i was i was operating like this um, uh, with Jerusalemsky, like uh, uh, understanding the canine well-being from the physiological standpoint, everyone who undertake that course, and this time we had um, like a lot of breeders and judges undertake that course, and, oh my God, I didn't know for this. I didn't know for this uh, uh, knowledge, and now it would be much easier to fulfill. So even the breeders are bad breeders, maybe because they just don't know. They don't have a good knowledge about that. They are driven by profit, but maybe that money would be invested in, in something else. So we, do, we never judge people that we say like, oh my God, I, uh, they are doing a bad job. But they, are doing, they are doing probably the best possible job they're able to. But if we will be in front of their doors trying to have them do better, probably this world would be, even if they don't want to do better, we need to inspire them to do better. And then the world becomes better, I guess. That's easier said than done. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, do we have any more questions here? Anything? Would what? You what does it? Sixty-year-old dog put her down. That's a question. That's. So she want to put him down, or the vet suggest? Oh, that's what, okay. I'm sorry. So there was a there was a question from the DM. It says like a dog dog is 16 years old, and um, the vet suggested to put the dog down. So it's always I was a veterinary vet, vet tech working, like in a, I have a clinical uh, experience, like working in the hospital, like a small animal hospital for maybe I don't know eight years. Uh, because I was volunteering into vet clinic since I was uh, 15 years old. And then, um, so euthanasia for me was just uh, part of doing. So, you know, you, the people come and then you present them the vet bill and they say, I can't afford this. I just maybe put my dog down or I can't care for him anymore. And I, I can't left him on the street. No shelters want to take them. So we just put them down. So I was just doing it left and right because it was so normal. And then lately when I did undergo about this and then I was starting uh, analyzing and learning more about animal consciousness and to, you know, give this uh, topic more, more attention and more emotion and more study, I said, like, uh, I don't support that anymore. Because that's exactly, you know, in English, you have wonderful phrase. It's not euthanasia. I know what said, like, I took my dog to be euthanized. No, and the people say, I put my dog down. That's the phrase we use. And it's true. We did put our dogs down. We betrayed them. That when I said, like, it's not easy to stay next to a dogs when they are breathing their last moments and breaths and days and maybe months, maybe years. But what's that in compared to all of that life and love they dedicated to us when we were going through our struggles of all kind? They were by our side, no matter how much, how hard we struggled, they were there supporting us. And now this, everything I do now, everything I talk, is just for those final days when they come and when they arrive to be as peaceful as possible. Because if we communicate with our dog properly, if we feed them proper food, if we care for them on the right time, they would just have a life, they would have uh, the peak of their life and slowly start to go in the ages of the time when they would just fell asleep and die in peace. Because they know that they are leaving us and they, we will be able to fulfill our life moving on the way, the best way we can. And why our dogs are suffering so long? Because they were f we were feeding them fast food with these kibbles for so long. 
we were not giving them the proper coding communication uh, strategy and we didn't know how to communicate their language. They lived the entire life in the stress and anxiety. They didn't trust us doing nothing. And now they don't want to die because they don't trust that we will be able and capable of surviving without them. So, and then I, I said to, to my friend a couple of days ago, it, I got also the message. He said, I have a dog six, uh, almost 17 years old, and I see like she can't move. I said, you, now it's our time to, to back them up. If they can move, we just need to take them. If they, if they pee like under themselves, we just keep changing. We be there for them because every single thing they are going now, it's because we put them on that path by doing and not doing right things. Because we fed them with what we gave them, because we communicated with them, we communi we had the life, we had the life, and this is the end we created together. And now, when it's my time to be strong, seeing someone I loved so much as they suffer as an outcome of my doings or not doings, it's my obligation to watch that and be by their side and take a responsibility of everything so I can be better pet parents to the next dog that comes after that and then let them peacefully die on their own no matter how long it's going to take. So the best advice I can give and I always give to the people just tell to your dog in peace and completely content that I am okay if you go. I can, I can take care about myself. And you go in peace, and I'll come when my time comes. We're going to be again together. And you will see, like every single time someone comes and approaches me, oh my God, sh what should I do? I said, just be by their side. Do whatever it needs to be done. If they are in pain, help them not have a pain. Pray for them. Sing for them. Try to find something what's good for them. Try to make up all of that beautiful years that you spent together worth of your time spending with them. It's going to take maybe a day, two, months, weeks, maybe a year. But what we need to do now is to create a place in which they can just die peacefully. My new book, my new book is uh, like, you know, getting shaped around. It's not done. It's not even close to be done, but it's named, it's called uh, The Dogs Die The Dogs Die Alone, right, kind of. And that's how the dogs like to die, alone. Because dogs are animals that would usually do that in a, in a nature as well, like elephants. They're very strongly compacted family animals. How do they do when the time comes for them to move on with their life on another way? They would just move away from a herd. They would move away from their pack. And they would just die peacefully, alone. And that's what the dog's dignity is. I remember my grandmother, she had a dog that would, she would, they would leave. No one knew how old they were. And at once, oh my God. And then you would go just one day outside and he would be in his little corner, just peacefully died overnight. No suffering, no nothing. The time just came and he just died. So there is some sacred in us going through this with our dogs by being by their side. And it's not them who are suffering. Maybe if we, if we trust consciousness and we believe that the, uh, the canine and dog has consciousness because they have emotions and emotions arise from ability of the soul to experience life through the physical body. So if the dogs do have a soul and we try to believe in that and then no matter which kind of context of the soul after that life we take or it's a resurrection or it's a or it's a how you say that um, reincarnation or whatever we tend to believe there is a movement of the soul that comes after that right and then what uh, what is the final age of our life, when we call suffering, is actually time that prepares the soul for the next motion and the next movement. And usually the one that's going through the experience of the suffering, 
suffer less than the people observing the suffering. So you always need to be in peace. And I, I encourage you to start uh, seeing life as the journey with the end. Our end is on its way. And every single day we are closer to it, right? And we need to allow that to our dogs too. But then we need to approach it with dignity. And dignified die, life and dignified death is something that combines in one and creates a life of the experience, experience of the life. And I must say that I experienced uh, that of my grandmother, the, girl, the, the woman that raised me and had a very big imp impact in my life. And I was by her side when she died. And I can't, underst I can't explain to you which kind of dignity I felt and responsibility and sacred relationship with her that even expanded time that we spent together while she was alive. That I was so honored to be by her side when she did the last breath. That changed my life completely. So every single one Try to find the help. Talk to someone. Talk to me. I can take you through that journey. Because it's, it's an easy journey when you understand you are not alone. And you have someone by your side so you can be by their side. And that's where, the, that's where the, this understanding of the life and understanding of the death and as an outcome of the life becomes the moment when we start living the life fully engaged. And then we do, because pure love and harmony is all about that. What we need to do, you know, and it's combined in three play. We need to know how to interact with the dogs, how to properly feed them and how to care for them, to unite all of those three pieces into a perfect wellness outcome so the death of the dog and the final days of the dog can be peaceful, short and sacredly divine. And the, the way how that's going to unfold and happens depends on what we do while they are alive. And all of that is our uh, responsibility that we took on the moment when we said, yes, I'm going to provide for you. So I, I hope that answers the question. Maybe in a lot of words, a lot of emotions, but it, it, it is my standpoint. Okay, I think like we are already an hour here. Do we have any more questions? I hope you enjoyed this. Day. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it on this emotional um, emotional moment. I guess it's a good way maybe to take home. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know if I can feed him and then the other hand I'm gonna feed Adrian to die on his own all the time and then his dad handles the whole life. So it's very hard to go through. Yes. It's very hard to go through. It's, uh, who, who says that? Donna, thank you so much for sharing and being so vulnerable, vu vulnerable, if I can say. It's very hard to go through, but that's something, some, some uh, amazing strength of our life is born through that experience. And I know it's hard, but it's part of the life. And all of the people, I'm, I don't know, I will never, ever, I don't know how, I feel about that I was not by my mom when she died. And there's no second time I can get the chance. I was by my grandma when she died. And I know the difference in between my feelings towards my mom's dying and my grandma's dying. So I, uh, that's brave to do. And it just because the, the less they're going to suffer if the life that we provide for them will be in perfect balance and harmony towards their needs. And then if we replace their parents and we care for them properly, that peaceful end will just come naturally. So the more intact life we allow to those dogs to experience while by our side, the most amazing end they're going to have, the most easiest end they're going to have. And that's our responsibility to do. And all of this pure love and harmony is actually just to that point, to provide them for that to come peacefully. Do whatever we can 
and even more than that. And so it can come peacefully. Not that it's going to happen because no one of us is a, is, a, is a wizard and we don't need to be wizards. We just need to do the best we can do today. And we don't need, I encourage you again, I, I put the dogs left and right down. Maybe that's the reason why I'm so against it now. And I'm doing all of this so no dogs will be put down anymore by people. Like when I say put down, I mean mercifully killed, but actually betrayed. The put down sentence says it right. I put my dog down. And you can, you can kind of uh, translate that into I betrayed him. Or I betrayed them, like he, she, whatever. Sorry for the noise. I attended one of your Vishan classes online. Uh, it was near Vishan, very clear, and the system for the guidance group was in communication. Thank you so much for bringing that memory back, and thank you so much for being vulnerable at that and uh, as that as that. And I know that this topic op opens the wounds, but also opens a big uh, perception of the life. We need to do whatever we can do in order to provide their life in peace and harmony. That is why I changed the brand from Sasha Reese to Pure Love and Harmony. The Pure Love and Harmony is fully dedicated to the li long life of the dogs and humans interacting properly. Because that is where we're all, of, you know, you, you, you remember, I remember like a couple of days ago, I was thinking about that Bichon class, the live one, the Bichon Magic, I think that was, that was the name of that class. And it was amazing. But also then I was talking so much about the biomechanical model of the dog and harmony in the dog structure and how the standard should be interpreted and how the coat should be cared for and all of those. How, and in order to have a good coat, you need to properly nourish the dog and lower the stress and anxiety the possible way you can in order to create a beautiful a shape and sculpture. And this is what you said, that the little doggy died on her own in the home. That's so kind of beautiful. I can't say, I, I know it's hard, but it's so sacred. And it is beautiful because that is, you know, we, we, as, we attend all of this, all of this, uh, you know, celebrations of the life where we remember all the nice things happen to in our togetherness but then that moment when it comes like just i could not live with that anymore when i need to say for someone that was by my side when i was divorced when i when no one wanted to talk to me when i was the most alone when i didn't know where to turn there was a dog that saved my life I talked to the I talked to these people like uh, the, I wrote a blog a beautiful blog about this I like uh, no kill shelters for example like adopt the dog because dogs going to be killed and then we adopt the dogs from the shelters and then they didn't kill the dogs when he had 2 years but we killed them when they had 16 what's the difference the end of the dog is again is a euthanasia they just pro we just prolonged the euthanasia for 10 years is all of that life because of us? I wanted the dog, so I didn't let the, that dog euthanize at t years of two, but I let him euthanize at uh, year, years of 16 or 14. Is that the, is that's what's, what's, uh, what's um, um, acceptable or uh, that's uh, what's uh, mainstreamly okay to euthanize dogs when they are 16, when they need us the most of the last breath or euthanize them uh, when they are two because they are full of life? And we need them when they are full of light, but we don't need them when they are suffering. It's hard. It's just not fair. And more we, more we look at this with an open heart and a life and respect, and not with emotions, we're going to see that our heart open and embrace these words and truth of them as it's in a sense of celebrating their life through dignity. Okay, thank you so much with everyone to join us this evening. And I invite you again to follow me and come back uh, next week at um, 9 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday 
in another episode of this wonderful journey that I really enjoy and you find very inspiring to continue everything you wanted to know about dogs but you didn't have whom to ask and I promise you more interesting and thought-provoking answers about dog care um, on this channel. Thank you so much, have a wonderful evening and talk to you next week. Bye.